So good afternoon and welcome to when, where and how they want it, your guide to changing consumer preferences. I'm Katie Searles, I'm editor of Delivery X, and I'm joined by Alex, VP Product and Sales Manager at DHL E-Commerce Solution, and Anders, Carrier Manager for E-Commerce, Warehousing and Distribution at Bestseller. Alex has worked with DHL for 16 years, initially working as partner and managing director at DHL Consulting. He has over 10 years experience in worldwide logistics and supply chain consulting. And for the last five years, Alex has focused on global European parcel delivery, successfully building DHL e-commerce solutions parcel connect services, facilitating e-commerce deliveries in Europe. Whilst Anders has worked in fashion e-commerce for the past six years at Denmark-based family-owned clothing company Bestseller, he has worked within the logistics side of the business and is currently the carrier manager. Bestseller has around 16 million parcels on the roads each year to 15 different countries, with Anders managing the operations of this as well as the relationships with the carriers. Bestsellers has more than 17 different brands, including Jack Jones, Only and Vera Moda. Now, before we begin, we are going to have some audience participation this afternoon, as well as DHL providing the survey results to their latest research. We're going to ask for your views on logistics, last mile and sustainability. We'll be doing this by a simple raising of hands. So just as a practice question, just to get us started, we would like delegates to raise their hand to one of the following, just one. So to which extent do you think the provider or carrier influences the purchasing decision? Either a lot of influence, some influence, or no influence. So for those who think it's a lot of influence, can you please raise your hands now? Oh, okay. Those are the carrier Three. guys. Huh? Excellent. Yeah. Um, some influence. Okay, majority. No influence? Okay, good, very interesting. So DHL's recent survey, you found that 69% of your respondents had a similar viewpoint. And that, that leads us nicely into the survey results. Alex, do you want to take us through some of your findings? Yeah, first of all, um, hi, and th thanks for having us here. And thanks for joining. Uh, indeed, so I think it's great if I get it correctly, this group believes that it's 100% either some influence or a lot of influence. Uh, I think that's understandable, given we are part of we are that side of the industry. Um, actually, the survey we've done uh, is a consumer survey we've done in um, nine different European countries, and it's same direction, not as as, as aggressive. So, 70% uh, of the consumers say the the carrier has some or a lot of influence on the on the purchase uh, purchasing. 30% uh, say no influence. Yeah. So, nevertheless, same direction, and there was the test question. So, thanks for that. Um, yeah, just to just to round up what the research that we've done so as said it's a consumer research in nine European countries and just for you to give a feeling so it have been uh, it was in the UK Germany uh, Spain France uh, we looked into Poland Czech Austria Spain and the Netherlands um, so just to get a feeling which countries have been in scope here yeah and the survey let's start off with what you looked at for parcel lockers and there was some interesting findings some countries there's a much higher uptake already of use of parcel lockers was it 49 percent on poland yeah so a little bit more actually so one of the things that is i mean not new but still a still a hot topic and something to consider is obviously the whole last mile preference um, of consumers and again this is not how the actual volumes are flowing but how the consumer responded how they wanted yeah so just to put this in perspective um, so Across all the markets, the, the result was that the home delivery is still the dominant one with actually around 75 or 73 percent is still home delivery a dominant one. Um, we have around 5 percent. So we asked, OK, what about neighbor or safe place type of delivery? That's around 5 percent as a preference for consumers. Uh, and then we had a large chunk, uh, like 22 percent is either locker or service point delivery. So the whole arena of uh, you know, what we originally in the past called unattended delivery uh, is definitely had, uh, got another push, I think, with lockers being 13% and the unattended uh, being 9%. Before I go into the county differences, maybe not sure if you, if you see, see something else, Anders, in, in your world, so... 
no. First of all, uh, thanks for, for having me here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. But no, we we basically seeing the same results uh, when we look at the uh, the customer behavior and what our customers are asking for. Yeah. When you look at the different countries, um, um, I think uh, in the past, we, you know, as an ex-consultant, I would probably try to cluster them, but I don't know if that's actually the right way. I think each country you see has slight nuances which are different and some stick out. So um, as, you su as you said, Katie, um, if you take a country like Czech Republic, around 30% or more of the consumers uh, would prefer a delivery to a service point, yeah, so some sort of shop. Uh, which is then a lot different to Poland, as that you mentioned, where uh, more than 50% would actually be okay and to prefer a delivery into a locker. Yeah, I mean, not a surprise who deals with that market. Yeah, but you know, you see the differences already. Um, and then there's quite some markets uh, where really doorstep is su super dominant still, um, and you know, lockers and service points are below 10% in total. Yeah, so that includes countries like Germany, uh, Spain, Austria. Yeah, so that you see the diversity. Um, and and maybe a last thing to to mention, a country like Sweden, for example, where in the past at least. From my personal perspective, it was, for me, predominantly more like shop delivery and lockers. Uh, there was at least a preference uh, from the consumer side that 50% of the volume would be preferably go to a doorstep, which not sure if that is something that changed over the last couple of years. But so you see the differences by country, right? Yeah. And Anders, from a retailer's point of view, how do you see the parcel locker trend developing? Will more people be using them or will it be a balance between that and say click and collect? I think uh, for us it will be a mix. Uh, obviously we have quite a big retail business as well, so click and collect, hence the whole omni-channel perspective is also super interesting. But if we look at the, the sole e-com volume and, and the trends within that, I think uh, the parcel lockers will be a stepping stone for us to do more sustainable deliveries, first of all, but also to increase the convenience. Um, not only by the fact that parcel lockers is available 24-7, but also because uh, for carriers like DHL, they are much more scalable. It's easier to roll them out, especially short term. Um, yeah, so convenience will go up for sure. Thank you for mentioning the word convenience. That's very handy because we actually have a, another audience question. Um, so we want to find out from the people here, how do you see parcel lockers predominantly? So either put your hand up if you think it's a feature for consumer convenience or a feature for online shops to obtain a, an attractive delivery cost. So firstly, can I see a raise of hands? Who thinks it's convenience that would drive someone to use a parcel locker? Oh, lots. Okay. And now raise your hands if you think it is an attractive delivery cost feature. It's less, so it's convenience. And does that match up with DHL's findings? Well, we did. this is a question I think we, we didn't ask in this uh, because that's, I think it's a very provocative one because you guys had to choose between one. I think the, the honest truth, I would say, is probably it's a mix of both, of course. Yeah. So and I see a lot of nodding. So thanks for taking that provocative, simple, simplified one. Uh, but I guess I think also we talked about it unless you made some experience there as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it, is a, it is a mix of, uh, of both. Um, we've done some A-B testing where we uh, offered parcel locker deliveries uh, next to home delivery with the exact same value propositions. So no changes in shipping fees, shipping thresholds or delivery time. And by just making a default in the checkout, we saw that in a country like Denmark, we could actually move 7% of our customers towards parcel locker deliveries, wow. showing that it's certainly not for the cost, mm -hmm. but rather the convenience. And would, would you say this would, from, do you think this would work for all European markets? Uh, what is your feeling at least? Or have you done similar tests? Uh, it will not. We did similar tests in, in, in Belgium and the Netherlands, and here it was, it was only 2 to 3%, mm -hmm. which is also reflected in, in, in your survey. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the success criteria for parcel locker deliveries uh, varies per country. I think we have already discussed that, or we'll discuss it later as well. Um, but in the end of the day, yeah, it, w it will be a mix. Uh, in, 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 in bigger countries, geographic, uh, geographically bigger countries, it is maybe m more leaning towards the, the pricing, that, that we can offer attractive prices, mm -hmm. whereas in other countries like, like Denmark, where it's a smaller country, mm -hmm. uh, it's more on the convenience side. I think post Nord uh, with their swip boxes in, in Denmark, 
have, have done great uh, rolling out uh, these uh, very fast, very quick, as I mentioned before. Uh, and I think this is also why we noticed in Denmark that we could move 7% so easily towards the pass lockers because Danish customers see them as very convenient, uh, uh, a very convenient delivery option. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, for us, n no surprise. Uh, it just reconfirms for us as a provider that we invest in these uh, technology, of course, and, cap and the capabilities. Um, but also reminds me of, I mean, as a, as a, let's say, European product manager, I often get this point, Alex, you know, give me a fully harmonized product, right? Um, and then, I mean, my answer to that is, you know, that there are differences by country is, is not a, is not a bug, it's a feature basically, yeah? because this is what the consumer want in the country. So it's then my job or our job as a product guys to make the access to this simple. Yeah, but I think we have to, there's definitely these nuances we have to cater for uh, in, in the different countries. And as you said, so there will be, will be a mix. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So geographical differences, it's about finding a model that works for every individual country rather than just rolling out a technology. Yeah, so basically the way we approach it is um, in our, at least our European wide offering that we s the features are the same, but the usage can be different. So whatever you use the feature, you know, maybe it's not used at all in some countries, but in others it is. I mean, we haven't, we can talk a, f a very long time, for example, about cash on delivery, you know, just mentioning one of the uh, partially used services. But I think the goal is to have it, um, you know, accessible sim in a simple way across the different countries, but we will see that the actual usage, and, and I mean that I think both sides show this, will still remain different, but I think they are converging, yeah, over time. I think we will see similar splits over time, yeah. So we've already covered parcel lockers, convenience and cost. Another potential benefit is the sustainability savings. Yes. By using a partial locker instead of door-to-doors, there is one drop-off which could improve efficiencies and also the sustainability. Um, and that brings us nicely on to our next audience poll. It is the last one, I promise, and then we're done. <laughs> we're good. So which of the following would the audience most likely do in order to make your delivery more sustainable so either switch to collection have a longer delivery time or pay more for your delivery so firstly can I have a raise of hands who would switch to collection okay good number who would opt for a longer delivery time okay and who's willing to pay more So, yeah. which to collections popular? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I can then mirror what the what the research we've done said. Uh, I guess Anders will say in a second. It depends on how you ask the question. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, which is a good debate to have in a sec. But just on the we ex ex um, asked exactly that question, of course, uh, to uh, to to these nine in the consumers in the nine countries, um, and the result is that indeed so 17 percent on average, and I think the, the, the numbers were not very different by country. So 17% said um, they would be okay to switch to collection, which from my personal gut feeling in the beginning was, you know, mm, okay, I would have expected a little more. I think you also, you guys raised more hands, I think. Um, but then on the other end, if you consider that some markets have currently, um, you know, a relatively low share still, I think it would give them, that the whole topic would sh surely give it a boost. Yeah. yeah? So. Maybe before we I go on, but do you, I don't know how you see it, but I think that that's, that would be... I think, as, as you mentioned before, it, it's not fair to ask the audience to choose between A, B and C, because for sure it will be a, it will be a mix. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, the parcel lockers will be a stepping stone for us to do more sustainable deliveries, but also optimize cost. For the last uh, two to three months, I've been introduced to increasing fuel surcharges from most of our partners. Um, and uh, the parcel lockers is actually one of the areas where we can optimize cost uh, by doing the bulk deliveries you mentioned, um, but also do more sustainable deliveries. So a mix of, of both, I would say, is, uh, is the reason why we see the increase, uh, increasing interest in, in lockers. Yeah. And, and for us, we are trying to, uh, to also promote the lockers even more. Uh, so recently, we've also done some A-B testing on removing the free shipping threshold on home deliveries. Uh, to test what is the impact on average order value, average item per order, conversion rate, demand. And surprisingly, what we saw is that there is actually no dramatic decrease in these measures, or at least not a static decrease uh, across all our brands. So it seems that customers are actually okay with this, 
um, to to accept the the, uh, the parcel lockers. Yeah, and we saw from a few hands that went up during the poll, people are willing to pay more, albeit a few, for a more sustainable solution. So they're not abandoning the cart if they're having to be charged for delivery. That's acceptable if it's going to be in a green way. Yeah. So, you know, it, it did so coming. So 17% was switched to collection and then 24% said they would be willing to pay more, uh, which I think was a little bit more than I saw here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and um, again, to be fair, I mean, in this case, we didn't ask how much. Yeah, So it can be everything between one cent and whatever, five euro. Uh, and then I guess the percentage will, you know, have different outcome. But I, I still think it's a positive sign that there's a, willingness on the consumer side also to be part of this and i think again i think all across the complete chain we have to see what we make out of it um i think there's a of course an obligation from everybody to do you know the utmost to you know in, in their own realm to to change it but there's a few more complex topics and i think if we can jointly work on it i think that's a pretty good sign yeah so i think a quarter being willing in that direction was at least an outcome that that was that i think is quite positive yeah and the question asked if people were willing to have a longer delivery time, which is quite an interesting subject currently with rapid and ultra rapid deliveries. But people are willing to be patient. Would you find as a retailer that people are willing to wait? Yes, <laughs> but we need to offer both. You need so to offer both. What we're looking into is definitely to have the premium service which is next day delivery or at least within maximum two days. Um, but that part, the customers will have to pay for. Uh, so if they still want the, the free delivery, which customers are also used to nowadays, uh, again, depends on how you ask the question. You can yes. bias the numbers by that. But yeah, if, if, if they will still get the free deliveries, then they'll have to wait. And most likely it will not be at the doorstep delivery. It will be to, a, for example, a parcel locker. Um, that will definitely help us uh, not only cost-wise when the costs are increasing, we have to be honest, um, but also on the sustainability part because we can then maximize capacity. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, uh, dispatching our parcels from our warehouse and fulfillment sites each and every day, do half-empty trucks because the customers will need their parcel the next day, we can maybe accept to only do every second day and then utilize maximum capacity of our trucks, uh, less emissions, less cost, and the customers will still get that parcel within the promised delivery window, which they are okay with. And yeah. the DHL survey results, did they find people were willing to were willing to wait? Yeah, so I mean, impatient? exactly. So I mean, who had done the math, right? So the I mean, so 70% switch to collection, 25% roughly uh, pay more, and then the rest is like almost 60% was willing to uh, wait longer, have accept longer delivery times. Personally, I think that was a little surprising to me. Uh, um, but um, yeah, I think the way the way I think about it uh, personally is okay. One thing is maybe there's still some room to uh, move from uh, from air to road transport, or maybe even air to ocean or air to rail. Yeah, so I think there's this part. Uh, we do uh, ra a lot more rail transport now. Also, for example, our colleagues in Germany. Um, so that's one. Um, I think as a delivery provider in a country, I, I, there I don't see, I, I don't think it makes sense that we stop the parcels, right? I don't think also there's any there's any benefit in this also from a sustainability perspective because we anyways run the tours. So that I don't see but as you said, from my perspective the biggest question is more from the retailer perspective to see, okay, are you for example indeed waiting until a full truck is there before you dispatch it or I don't know if you would even go that far to consolidate delivery. So, you know, basically tell your consumers give out maybe even a further benefit or maybe even that even put that aside but to say like you have an order if you order something in the next three days uh th i don't know maybe there's a certain benefit and then you know you will do the order together is that something that you guys are thinking about or i think in in in, in general uh it's, it's it's always about communication and how you communicate to the customers but in generally ex expanding the delivery window and maybe even mm. only doing the upper upper value, so you say two to five days, I think most customers will accept that as long as you still have the premium service next to that, as I mentioned before, because that gives us the flexibility uh, without, you know, being forced to communicate in a very detailed way to only do, let's say, every second day or when we have a full truck, which might be even uh, every third day then. Um, okay. 
I think also from a the uh, from a uh, from the carrier's point of view. So in this case, DHL, I think. Uh, for sure, you should not stop the runs, so the waves you're running in, in your fulfillment sites, but maybe you could even do, uh, instead of three waves during the day, only two. And in the first wave, which is where you sort the deliveries for, for, for the evening delivery, you can prioritize the premium services that we have sold to the customers, so guaranteed same day or next day delivery. Mm -hmm. And then the second wave, you only do the, uh, the, uh, the other uh, delivery type that we offer to the customer, which is two to three days or two to five days yep. even. Um, that could also, from a sustainability point of view, gain, uh, yep. gain you some benefits that you can share with us. Got it, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, I think that, 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 well. I think yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that's a good point also. I think if you if you when the areas where we have different waves, I mean, some of that was I mean, it's not only driven, that's partially driven due to service um, improvement. So exactly to allow a near same day type of delivery um, or better cut off times. Um, but it was also driven, I think, it's fair to say, with the, the 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 large increase of volume to be able to at all being able to handle the volume, right? So I mean, using more sorting capacity. So, um, but yeah, I think it's it's a good point to look into this. I think it what you say is happening, but maybe not as explicit as you said. I yeah. was just about to say explicit, yeah, because if we are totally aware of that, you will only sort these parcels whenever you have empty capacity in a certain wave. And as long as we communicate that to our customers in the checkout, mm -hmm. everyone's happy. Yeah. That's what yes. the our goal. survey also yeah. is telling us. That's true. I guess our goal is not to have empty capacity. <laughs> but we're working on that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, n nevertheless, I think there was an interesting one. And I think somewhere in this waiting type of thing and the willingness to accept longer lead times, is, you know, especially in international setting, I think that's something to be, to be reviewed also from our side. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, on the same, maybe I'm just saying one, one more number. At the same time, uh, we get 12% of card shopping cart abandonment is um, because of too slow delivery. Uh, so I think that's where the balance, I think, has to... I mean, you say maybe next day service or something? Yeah, but, but it again depends on how you ask the question. Because if you ask the question that uh, mm -hmm. is it too slow delivery only with one delivery option? Or is it with also the alternative one that I mentioned? So that you actually give the customer the choice to say, okay, if you want the premium service, yep. you need to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, and if you can accept the longer lead times, you'll yep. also get the free delivery. You can even get the small green leaf in the checkout telling the customers that it's also even more sustainable. Yes. I think that will bias the numbers, yep. depending on how you ask the question. No, nope, agree. I mean, that if it, indeed, if it's unprompted, then that's the result. Yep. Um, but of, of course, many because that's, the that's players have that you know, offer that service range. Yeah. That's what we saw from the A-B testing we did, at least, mm -hmm. that we didn't see a decrease in conversion rate yeah. when we did these changes in the checkout on home delivery versus parcel locker deliveries. Yeah. And I think the results will be the same, uh, not only on home delivery versus parcel lockers, but also on lead time. Yeah. Fast deliveries versus slower deliveries. Yeah, yeah. I think that's encouraging, I would say. Uh, and I think it's good to hear that perspective as well, right? So because that's what we are debating also, and I think it's good to, to have it jointly. Yeah. To come back to your little green leaf, so the the consumers have the choice to pick a sustainable delivery option. We are seeing more environmentally conscious consumers. So is that something, are consumers becoming more aware of the carriers and the choices that they potentially have? For sure they are. For sure they are. Uh, the tricky thing for us now is uh, it's the whole aspect about greenwashing. We have a lot of carriers, I've talked with a lot of carriers even today, that, that are arguing that, yeah, we're 100% emission free. <laughs> well, uh, some of them are doing offsetting, some of them is uh, only in the combustion phase, so question is it uh, tank to wheel or well to wheel. Uh, for us, as, as, a, as, a, as an e-tailer, uh, it's, it's really tricky to communicate, so... so um, but we're trying our best, and, and we also see, uh, again, from some testing we did, uh, actually with DHL and their Go Green services they, they, they are offering, that, yeah, some customers are actually preferring uh, the delivery options where they can see the green leaf. Uh, we are, although not saying that it's emission-free, because it's compensated. Yes. So what we basically just state in our checkout, at least at Bestseller, is the parcel is climate compensated. So we make that very clear to the customers. Yeah. And that's why we have the green leaf in there. It's a minefield, climate, as you said, climate positive, 
carbon negative, carbon neutral. Green deliveries. I mean, <laughs> often when, when, when carriers are telling me that, yeah, we do green deliveries, I, I, I always ask them, what is a green delivery? Yeah. Because there's always a green alternative. There will always be a green alternative. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, from my perspective, I think this topic can go on for three hours. <laughs> yeah. But uh, just a quick comment from my side. So I think the industry has really, I mean, started early, had reached a certain level. And now I think it's really on in the middle of a next S-curve for sure and a lot of good reasons. Um, and there's, of course, the offsetting piece, which is actually a 10 year old construct that we also offer for 10 years, actually, in, for example, in Germany. So um, but now it's really about i think the the end target is having green deliveries as green as possible i think um uh like fully green maybe is and in a way never obtainable but really green deliveries including the middle mile pieces and transport pieces yeah but that's a journey i think the the electrification or the generally the last mile is is i think relatively clear how to get there but it's still it's still especially on a mass market scale you know that takes a little bit of time and some countries are more advanced but i think really good investments happening and i think on the trucking side of things also good movement but still the question is uh you know what will be you know we we have different availability of technology uh fuel types and everything by country and infrastructure um but uh, for me that's more just a question of time I think it's really on the on the right track. Maybe you know, if you speak the globe, and that's my personal view, could it be faster? Should it be faster? Maybe yes. But I think if you consider the size of this, I think it's on a good track. Um, so, um, but it's it's still a way to go. Yeah. Perfect. And in the meantime, we can do offsetting yes. or climate compensating. But as long as it's not a trade-off for actually trying to reduce emissions as much as we can yes. and invest into the technology right. and infrastructure which yes. is needed. Yes, I mean the same with the parcel with even the collection right so um i mean the the extreme you get when you talk about it about okay switching to collection is maybe a greener alternative well if you pick it up 20 kilometers with your own car maybe not yeah um so that's why if you if you if you do these things then you have to be transparent about it that's important that's what we try to do and also um uh you know ensure that the network you're offering is dense enough Exactly. That nobody has to, I mean, maybe somebody has to, but you know, the majority will not sit and jump in a car and drive 20 kilometers. Eh? That's actually one of the reasons why we are currently not communicating to our customers in the checkout that parcel locker deliveries are more green or more sustainable than home deliveries, simply because it's impossible for us to measure the total end to end flow. How are the customers? going to the parcel locker to pick up their parcel. There is based on a lot of assumptions and namely because of green rushing, as I mentioned before, we don't dare to communicate that. Uh, although I have multiple carriers telling me every day that do parcel locker deliveries, they are more sustainable. I know they are for sure, but about how much? I have some carriers telling me it's 30%. Whenever I ask for the documentation, they're like, nah, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> yeah, but it, the good thing about all of this, it can be calculated. So it can be the thing, um, and I think for me, personal view is we have just have to be transparent what we talk about. And if we say, look, this part gets better, but you know, be mindful of the other part also. I think, you know, then it's an individual choice what to do, right? Yeah. And um, I, I get why you have your choice. Others make it do it differently. Yeah, but um, so I think, yeah, I think it, the good thing is it is measurable. Yeah. I think <coughs> the results today have shown nothing can be done. In a silo, it has to be a combination of these things, offering package or lockers, offering click and collect, offering deliveries from an e-cargo bike. It's a combination. It's a collaborative effort, either between carriers or internally. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can start. And so from my perspective, what we also see a lot is that the consumers, that's also part of the survey, I mean, I don't know, it's the same for you as a, pers as a private person, right? You want to know about your parcel. Yeah, that's something different than a network parcel. And this is something where I think we, are, we have to indeed work together to see, okay, at, the at least share as much as possible what's happening to the individual parcel. Uh, so that we can say, in indeed, this one will be delivered by a bike or by an e electric van. Yeah, you know, and maybe I know it's just a starting point, but, you know, that's that individual one will be. And I think yeah. to make this happen and so that his customers see it in the shop, we have to exchange information, right? And that's, that's, that's why you're right. I think it has to be end-to-end. Yeah. yeah, and I think um, 
I've already mentioned uh, a couple of times that it really depends on, uh, on on how you ask the question, but also how you you display the del delivery options to to the customers. So in the A/B testing that we have done, which I've mentioned also a couple of times, we only changed one parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, what if we change both delivery time and the shipping fee, or the shipping fee and the shipping threshold? then we would probably see some other results. So for sure, it will be a mix. Uh, and we need to find a balance here, uh, for sure. Yeah. Was there anything else in your survey results that you wanted to share that you really wanted to pinpoint that you think are, is key? Um, I wanted to uh, just use the opportunity to ask one more question, maybe to Anders, and it's uh, uh, just an open question, really. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, Look, uh, so, so the survey we've done actually did was a lot broader than actual delivery. So we also looked into um, where, you know, how do consumers shop? Where do they shop? I mean, they're uh, surprised to see the percentage that buys on TikTok. Yeah, so whatever. So there's really these things and the payment types. Uh, but maybe I'm getting old. Yeah. Um, the um, one of the things that popped up in commentary was a lot about, OK, that consumers were in generally interested to learn more about the goods they purchase and they want to have more description and more, maybe more video type of description. And, you know, that's the good itself, right? But I was wondering if, it, if there's a link to logistics. I mean, do we need to explain it better what's happening? And if yes, I mean, do we need videos, you know, that show, is, is it too much or not? But it's a thought I have. It's, it's definitely not too much. And I think there is a direct link to specifically the returns within logistics. Mm. Because at least in fast fashion as, as we're in, we have insane high return rates, mm -hmm. plus 50% in, 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 in most markets. And the, the better we can uh, show our customers what are they actually buying, mm -hmm. uh, what are they fitting on, on, on certain models, uh, the lower return rates, we know that. So not too much, definitely not. Maybe something to work on. That is, uh, that's a pain point for us. That's, that's no secret, the, that, yeah. the, the high return rates. And, and we're doing everything we can to reduce the return rates. But there are also some, some, some customer preferences out there, which is, you know been engraved for years by players like us, Salando, that you know, always free return and these things that you know, are driving up the return rates uh, to crazy high numbers. Yeah. And that we cannot change. We cannot just, you know, remove the free shipping, uh, or sorry, the, f the free return. So we need to look into other param yeah. parameters like the video uh, you mentioned. Okay, thanks. Returns is an interesting challenge, but one that maybe, again, parcel lockers could help with. Instead of people having to drive to the store, could they potentially use this technology to return it to a parcel locker? Yeah. Yeah, th this is what we do. I mean, the fun I mean, you could, you could maybe it's also a, a, a dr dressing room or something. I mean, there's all sorts of concepts I think on the returns, right? So that you um, uh, that you that you immediately uh, send them back and all these sorts of things, and you know, just have one stop. So there's a lot of that. But in general, I think most of the returns are not pickup returns, so they're dropped um, uh, in lockers or service points. Yeah. Okay. I think we can't really ignore that there has been significant changes in the last 20 odd months because of a certain pandemic. So we are back to face to face, we're back in person, it's very exciting. But I think as a round up, as a last question to finish to both of you, just if you can really try and pinpoint what's changed from a retailer point of view, from a carrier point of view, as a reaction to COVID. Alex, you want to start off? Yeah, it's hard to say. So first of all, um, I think it got a lot more dynamic um, and I think it will stay that way. And I said, I said before, if I look, just look at the last my preferences, uh, it, it maybe did something to what the consumer is doing in the Nordics, for example, which maybe was different than before. Uh, it did something to, um, to other countries. So I think there's, it's converging that we have all different modes, basically. So that's one of the things. And then, um, of course, we through the pandemic, we all of us are kind of dealt in working with a very high load of volume. So I think we are geared up uh, for a certain level of, um, of, of capacity and how to deal with that. And I think also, again, change more information, exchange more information to be able to cope. Uh, so those are the two things that f mainly come to my mind. And then I think apart from that, I think that was there before, but the whole sustainability piece, as said before, I think we got is on the US S curve. And Anders, from a retailer point of view, what's been the big shift? 
Um, uh, biggest change, most carriers have removed the POD on, uh, on home delivery. Um, and maybe, you know, that was one of the things you got from, from, from a home delivery besides the service of, of obviously de delivering to home. You also got the POD, so the customer signed for it. Now we don't no longer have that um, on, on the home delivery. So versus parcel locker deliveries, you know, that's, it's more of, of an equal service on that parameter specifically. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I agree to all of the, the points you mentioned, uh, all good points. And to look ahead, what's next for bestseller? <laughs> uh, roll out of more parcel locker uh, options uh, <laughs> in, 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 in countries. So, so the A-B testing I mentioned a lot of times already, we did, we've done in, in Denmark, the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, we are planning to roll out uh, and also promote parcel locker deliveries more in also the southern uh, regions, so Spain and France, where we know also from the survey that customers are very much into home deliveries, but we need to do our best uh, to promote the, the parcel lockers, um, both from a cost perspective, as we've discussed, but certainly also from a sustainability perspective. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, I, I now have to add a word of advertising because just sorry I had to, I have to do that <laughs> because so that I think we are believer of this for a while and that's why we have connected now more than eighty seven thousand service points and lockers across Europe on our Parcel Connect platform and um, yeah and it depend doesn't matter if it's a large country or a small country and we are continuously working with our partners to and our own entities to increase that service because I think it more and more is uh, becomes a significant share of the last mile and of course returns and so on yeah so that's why i'm happy to help and as well as parcel lockers what else are dhl doing to to be as sustainable as possible for the future yeah as said before so i think first of all we, we're working on making our own deliveries um and the delivery networks more sustainable uh, i mean similar like everybody else really to see push the last mile but also work I think really with a lot of providers to see okay how what are what is the and also a little bit by country at this point giving the different setups there's also different regulatory setups by country what's allowed what's not allowed and I guess many of you have experienced that so but I think then also on the everything which is trucking related so I think this is the that's the, our obligation there then uh, we are generally working on models to really develop a green alternative for our core products. I mean, as green as possible and also not offsetting, but maybe also in the area of insetting and other tools. So that's the second one. Um, and I think then what I, person what I personally think is important, what I mentioned is my shipment level, uh, really the individual piece that as m we exchange enough information so that at least a the consumer or me, when I order something, I know Fact, as factual as possible how green it is uh, and how, 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 how much it's possible to you know uh, predict this in a network setting but I think that's, that, that's possible those, I think those are the main things that we're looking at Perfect Good that you added as green as possible else I would have asked you what is green <laughs> Yeah I try to work around <laughs> that one so but we can maybe do that later yeah. Anything else? But from my side That's it Yeah well, firstly, I'd like to thank Anders, to thank Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. thank the audience for listening. If you do have any questions for our panellists, you can visit the DHL stand or <laughs> the networking drinks, which just happen to be sponsored by DHL. Uh, the next rapid fire debate will come from Peter Blackburn of InPost, who will look at parcel lockers and ask, is now the moment for retailers to embrace out of home? So nice tie in there. But I think it's just a round of applause for our panelists, please, Anders and Alex. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>